Good day, everyone, and welcome to Understanding the Past to Improve the Future. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded, and at this time, I would like to turn the webinar over to Nigel Van. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, and good morning, good afternoon to everybody. And again, welcome to today's National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse webinar. Um, as you heard, we're going to talk about understanding the past to improve the future. We thought as we we're um, entering this um, third decade of the century, it was a good time to take a look at what we've learned um, about fatherhood work over the last 30 to 40 years. So just a few quick reminders of how this um, screen works. You'll see um, on the left-hand side a chat box. You can talk to each other in there. But if you do have a question for the presenters, we ask that you put that down the ask a question box in the bottom right-hand corner. The webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording, a transcript, and all the presentation materials will be posted on our website in the next month or so. So please check back to review. And you can also find recordings and materials from all the previous webinars at fatherhood.gov backslash webinars. We've got a bunch of downloadable resources for you in the downloadable resources box at the bottom. And I certainly encourage you to um, download all those. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's in there as we go through. And we've got various web links on the left-hand side there, including a link to our Responsible Fatherhood Toolkit, which we'll be, we will be referencing quite a lot today. So let me um, just move our first slide here. And this is just a quick overview for those of you who haven't joined us before. Um, here at the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse, um, we are supported by the Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Children and Families, Office of Family Assistance. And on their behalf, we provide various resources for dads, fatherhood programs, researchers, policymakers, and all other interested parties. You can find us on the web at fatherhood.gov. Uh, again, you can find our toolkit and our, our webinars at those links. You can contact us via email at help at fatherhood.gov.info. And we encourage you to um, use or encourage fathers to use our national call center toll-free line, which is 877-4DAD-411. And also encourage you to engage with us via Facebook and Twitter. And talking of Twitter, we are going to have a Twitter chat next Tuesday, February the 25th. You know, we did a webinar last year on co-parenting, and it was one of the most popular webinars we've done. It was certainly the most attended one we did last year. So we are going to do this Twitter chat. You can follow that chat at hashtag fatherhoodrocks at um, 8.30 to 9.30 Eastern time on Tuesday. Also coming up, our next webinar in April, April 22nd, will be a follow-up to that co-parenting webinar from last year, and we're calling this one Co-Parenting 201 Tips to Fatherhood Programs. So hope you can join us for that as well. Now today, um, I am joined by four of my colleagues here at the Clearing House, and we are really looking forward to this conversation. Um, between us, we've got over 100 years of experience in this field, so it's, um, it's quite exciting to be talking about this together. Um, I'm not going to introduce um, my colleagues right now. You can download their full bios from the downloadable resources section. I'll say a brief word about each of them as it comes up for their turn to speak. And they're each going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then they're going to, then we're going to look into the future. So we're going to talk about where we are, and then we're going to take a, a bit of a break for that. But it is, um, it's a great honor to be able to share this with them today. And because we've got five presenters, I'm actually going to present a little bit today as well. We are going to stay on until 2.45 Eastern, um, if needed, to answer any questions. So we encourage you to stay if you can for that. And you can also, in the downloadable resources, you can download the slides for the day so you have that uh, later review. So the focus today is going to be on promising practices 
that have been identified by research studies as well as the lessons that we've learned from our work in the field. A lot of those lessons are in the responsible fatherhood toolkit. And just in terms of how we decided to frame our comments today, you're not going to see this necessarily throughout the webinar, but we've been thinking about what have we, in terms of the responsible fatherhood field, done over the last 30 to 40 years? What have we learned? What are we doing based on those lessons? And where are we going? So you get actually get to see my face for, for once this time. I am the product development lead for the uh, Clearing House. And on this slide, we've just jotted a few things down about what has happened in the field. We can definitely say that fathers are important in the lives of their children, but we also know that some fathers face challenges that can get in the way of their ability to be positively involved in their children's lives. And that's why there have been and are a lot of programs that work around the country to help fathers, irrespective of whatever their personal situation may be. And we've learned a lot about promising practices and what it's um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. But there's still a need for more random control, or commonly referred to as RCT evaluations, that can more clearly link program outcomes and strategies to evidence-based outcomes. And Mindy will be addressing that a little bit as um, she gets into her remarks. I'm just going to set the stage a little bit here with a little bit of brief history. And I'm going to put in a little bit of personal history here, too. Um, you know, we can trace this work actually back even further than I have done on this screen. We can trace it back to at least the mid-1970s when Charles Ballard started working with fathers in Cleveland. He had um, been incarcerated for a crime that he did not commit and, and wanted to help other men when he came out avoid some of the obstacles he faced. So he actually just started going door to door in Cleveland and then he worked through a hospital outreach program. and. Well, let me, let me say after that, you know, then I got involved in this work in 1988. So I got involved in between those first two projects. Um, I, I was actually hired to manage a program in Maryland that was referred to as the Absent Parents Employment Program. Now, one of the first things I learned there was that uh, many of those dads were not absent. Many of them were involved in their dad's lives, much more so than people tend to think. And even those who weren't involved, you know, but they had um, what we've referred to in the field quite a bit as a hole in the heart. But they faced a burden, they carried a burden um, that still impacted other aspects of their lives and, and really were, were crying out for help in many ways even if they didn't know it. One of the first things I did in that job was start looking around the country to see what else was going on in terms of work with fathers. And I, the, I was really surprised that there was a lot going on. Um, and the more I looked and talked to people, the more programs I found. A big starting point for me was a 1987 publication that came from the Children's Defense Fund. It was called What About the Boys? And one of the big things it had in there was information on the teen father collaboration that had run from 1983 to 1985. And I was lucky enough to about half of the, there were eight programs involved in that. And at least half of them were still serving dads. So I was able to talk to and meet a lot of the people who were working in those programs and even some of the people who had done the earlier programs. And as I talked to people, I, I met more people. Um, so I uh, really was, was just totally fortunate that I, I fell into this field then and I've been in it ever since. Uh, when I was, and I was involved in, all the things on the screen here in one way or another. Um, when I was at Public Private Ventures working on the Young Owned with Fathers pilot project, we developed the father development curriculum and we began training programs around the country in that. That work has been carried on by the National Partnership for Community Leadership, uh, commonly known as MPCL, so you can still get that curriculum through them. The curriculum was actually adapted as the responsible father's curriculum, and that was the curriculum that was used in the Parents Fair Share project. I particularly want to flag here the National Practitioners Network for Fathers and Families. That came about in just after 1994. In 1994, um, Al Gore, who was Vice President at the time, convened a 
a gathering of uh, fatherhood practitioners and other people involved in the work. And a few years after that, the Ford Foundation supported the development of this practitioners network. And it, it lasted for, it may have actually started before 1997, as I think about it now, but it lasted for at least five years um, until the funding ran out, unfortunately. And um, much of this early history was supported by private foundations, often in partnership with the federal government, but not as much as it has been since 2006, when the federal government has really stepped up through the Office of Family Assistance and is now supporting all aspects of fatherhood. And the private foundations are probably working more on the local level now. In the early days as well, the um, Office of Child Support Enforcement played a big role and still do. Department of Labor funded quite a few efforts, as did the um, Department of Education and, Agri and Agriculture. They were all involved, actually, in the Young Unwed um, Fathers Project. These reports here are reports on those early projects, uh, except for the Partners for Fragile Families. All the findings are summarized in the two publications at the bottom of the screen there. You can download from the downloadable resources section a summary of some of these early lessons, and you can also download a full list of helpful resources that includes these studies as well as quite a few more. This is just a, a quick summary of some of those early lessons. The way I used to present this, and I'm going back to the early 90s now, was some of the first presentations I gave on the Young Unwed Fathers pilot project. And the way I used to talk about this, which I, have, I think helps summarize this slide, so I don't have to read everything on the slide, but um, I used to talk about the fact, and remember this is also shortly after the movie Field of Dreams came out, where they built something and they said people would come. And I used to say that about this, about fatherhood work. They will come, but it takes time. They will stay if there's something real for them. But even then, this work is not easy. And, and, and it's, you've got to be real if they're going to stay. But these dads, many of them face personal obstacles as a result of their life experiences. Many of the early programs were not particularly father friendly. They were not set up to help dads, particularly low income dads. And that's particularly true of partner agencies that people try to work with like the local employment agencies, were not used to working with fathers. They were more used to working with mothers who were there because of welfare. And um, public policies, you know, the, the main public policy was child support, trying to get dads to come in and pay child support. And if they weren't able to pay, they were putting them in jail in a lot of cases. That's why that early program I got involved in Maryland began because um, there was a recognition by some local judges that they, they needed to help the guys rather than just treat them punitively. So we've been talking about this as a team as, as we prepared for this presentation, and, and we think it makes sense to put these, some of these findings into, to break it down into some, into some program areas. And um, we, this is how we've done that. Um, there are other ways this might be organized, but we, we think this, um, helps to provide a snapshot of, of what we've learned. So it's certainly important to have staff who can relate to dads and gain their trust and respect, because if you don't do that, you, know, you haven't got a program. And it's important to have community partners who can help you spread the word in the community, make direct referrals, but also to provide services, because a father's program, unless it's housed in an organization that has all sorts of resources, cannot do everything. And even then, you still need partners in the community. So we're going to be talking about partnership development a little bit as we move forward here. And, and it's certainly um, essential that you have effective outreach and recruitment um, mechanisms. You know, men typically do not think about asking for help, certainly around fatherhood. And if you want me to come to a program as a man, you're going to have to show me what's possible and why I should be interested. And you're going to have to talk to me in a certain way. Now, in, in my experience, once you do get dads into a program, what keeps them there is a combination of a respectful, trusting, one-on-one -on -one relationship with one or more staff members. 
but it's um, I think even more so depends on the relationship that the, the men form with each other in the program so that you do get a true peer support program. And that's where having an effective group facilitator really comes into play. You know, an effective group facilitator who can help the men in the program look back on their own personal experiences, process their own journey, their own life experiences, own up, you know, when, when they haven't done everything that they might have done, but also reflect on how they got to be where they are. You know, a lot of that is talking about your relationship with your own father. And when you see a group of men get together and start doing that and often share things that they've never shared with anybody else in their life, they've maybe not even let themselves be upfront about how they feel about the relationship they have with their father, be that a positive one, a negative one, or anywhere in between. But once you get a group of men who really get to share that experience together, they will then hold each other accountable moving through the program. And it really does become what's been referred to as the glue that can keep fathers involved in the program and help them move forward on their own personal journeys. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Mindy in just a minute to talk more about what we know about program content and outcomes and some of the more um, recent and ongoing research studies. But before I do that, I just want to pull up our first poll question. So, Enzo, can we get the, the first poll question? And we do this just to get a sense of who's, who's in the room with us, if you like. So we'd just like to know how long you've worked in the fatherhood field. So any involvement with fatherhood programs, direct services, management, research, policy, any, any other way in which you may have um, helped in this field. OK, so it looks like we've got about a fifth of you who've been doing it between 10 and 20 years. So that's. Um, that's very encouraging. And we've got a whole chunk of people in the various ones before that. We've got just over 6%, um, 20 to 30 years. And we've got 5% of you have been doing it for more than 30 years. So again, very encouraging. So um, I'm not the only old dude on the line, I guess. Um, OK, well, thank you very much for that. So with that, um, let me bring Mindy's introductory slide up here, and I'll just very briefly introduce her. So Mindy is our research lead here um, at the Clearing House. She's also the director and a research scientist at Child Trends, where she leads their fatherhood and parenting programs. She's been part of our NFC team, NISC team for over five years now, and she helps with the um, whole project development side. She and I work, work very closely together, and she oversees the the work of the child trained staff on the development of various research projects. Um, she's speaking to us today from upstate New York, where she and her husband recently moved. So, Mindy, the time is yours. Tell us what's going on in the research world. Well, great. Thanks, Nigel. And good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be part of the team presenting today and thinking about both programmatic efforts and research and evaluation. Um, and the lessons learned in future directions for the fatherhood field. Nigel pro provided a really nice summary of early research practice efforts, or early program efforts, and then sort of directly aligned with that work is a, a, a really robust body of research and evaluation. And there's been an impressive amount of research conducted over time in an effort to understand the nature of fathers relationships with partners and children, the constellation of service needs that fathers have, and overall to help to inform and improve programs for fathers. And, and here on this slide, we've listed uh, some of the more recently completed projects and research studies that have been funded by the federal government, um, and then a few more on the next slide. And, and so you can see there's just a, a lot of impressive work being done, and this is just at the federal level. So Combined with this is, is other strong work being done at the state level and within individual organizations. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about every single one of these studies, but generally wanted to, to note a few things overall about the types of research and evaluation being done. This work represents a mix of 
impact implementation and descriptive study. So all taking different perspectives in, to the research, different questions being answered um, by these different studies, um, but really exploring a range of questions that help to build the evidence base for fatherhood programming. And just a, a couple of examples of some of the questions being asked. Um, the first study here, the parents and children together for past evaluation, that is a recently completed experimental evaluation, so the RCT type uh, rigorous evaluation design that Nigel mentioned, uh, focusing on responsible fatherhood services specifically for low-income fathers. Another study that has uh, kind of different goals and different questions is at the bottom of the slide, the strengthening the implementation of responsible fatherhood program study. That's a more recently in, uh, funded project and answers questions very much related to program implementation. So the goal for that work is to identify implementation challenges in fatherhood programming to design and test solutions to those challenges using innovative evaluation methods, and then to adapt and improve approaches based on those findings. So a very intentional focus on program implementation. Other studies here look at different aspects of fatherhood programming and really the content of the programs being delivered. Uh, for example, asking questions about how fatherhood programs address things like intimate partner violence, more co-parenting, or healthy relationships more generally. And then also, it, it's important to think about the fathers in the program, and sort of different characteristics that fathers have. And um, some studies have been designed specifically for more re-entering fathers. Other studies have been designed specifically for more fathers of children involved in the child welfare system. So a, a very wide range of research questions being asked and for different types of fathers and families. For more information about these studies, there's several reports that have been, being, been published. These provide background on the studies, findings from the studies, and then also a nice, some nice pieces on just the general state of fatherhood research and programming and sort of priorities for research and future directions for research. And the clearinghouse has contributed to, the, contributed to this body of knowledge through the research products that the team has developed. And, and this book is on synthesizing research and translating that more for a practice audience. And so the clearinghouse has several research briefs focused on using documentation and data in programs, forging effective partnerships, um, and then also topics like recruitment and retention, so really focusing on research-based approaches in these different areas of implementation. So I'd like to introduce those key areas of programming that are important for serving fathers, and many of the research studies that we've been discussing also focus on those areas. And so here we've included just a few examples of strategies or practices that have emerged through these research and evaluation studies um, as important from fatherhood program implementation. So for example, training staff in trauma awareness and appropriate responses to signs of trauma. Leveraging partnerships can really be important for providing a range of services to fathers, as Nigel mentioned, and in, in particular if there are certain restrictions for what a fatherhood program can do with their funding, for example, then partnerships can help to, to expand and, and provide access to fathers to services that may not be covered um, by that, some specific types of funding. In terms of outreach and recruitment, Nadja mentioned the importance of just getting fathers in the door, so thinking about ways to get fathers interested and aware of programs, and with the idea that once they're there and really see the value of the programs, They'll, they'll keep coming back. Um, one important piece of that, though, is really being flexible, creative, and able to respond to sort of the, the context and the situations that fathers um, bring and, and want from the program. So really being able to adapt approaches and, and programming and being flexible once the dads are there to keep them interested in, in coming back. 
Um, one thing to note about all of these different strategies is that they are drawn from a range of different types of research studies. Some of those are more descriptive, some focus on implementation, some on the effectiveness of fatherhood programs in, in achieving their outcomes. So we can't always say for sure which specific practices actually lead to a program being more successful or not. Um, but already I, I, I've seen sort of some common themes across um, Nigel and um, my, my takeaways. And then you'll hear some similar themes again from the rest of the speakers. And so there is a, a convergence in some research and from being on the ground working directly with fathers and some of these strategies. And these provide a nice opportunity to think about testing some of these strategies uh, through future research and evaluation. And we'll talk more about future directions uh, for that later. I wanted to just review a few more strategies um, from some of these research studies. So looking at group facilitation, examples of promising strategies include emphasizing and supporting fathers in their own personal development as part of workshops, and then thinking about matching staff to participants. And so having staff with similar backgrounds. And here, research tends to look at a lot of a different types of characteristics of, of staff and facilitators, uh, for example, gender, race, ethnicity, um, but also facilitators' experiences. Um, so kind of thinking about having facilitators with shared experiences or similar circumstances that the fathers have to really help the father help relate to the fathers. Um, also skills, and many of these are teachable, but it's important to think about other types of skills that, that successful facilitators may need. And this could in involve training on some of these things. So um, things like just kind of the ability to re relate to others more generally and apply that to, to the fathers that one the staff are working with really having the knowledge um, of one's community, services developed in the community, and, and the ability to connect fathers to services and opportunities. And then overall just being a good role model. So kind of demonstrating the behaviors and skills and practices that you're you're wanting the fathers to, to model. And so being kind of being that representative for fathers. And then in terms of program content, this is a place where evaluation research can, can formally test whether participating in a fatherhood program can result in specific outcomes for fathers. And we've listed a few key outcomes here that are examined in studies. Um, the PAC evaluation is an example that looked at nurturing behaviors, engagement with children, employment and through uh, an experimental evaluation found that the fatherhood programs in that evaluation compared to usual services available in the community did improve fathers nurturing behaviors, fathers engagement with children and age appropriate activities. I thought that was a important distinction in terms of how they how that study measured engagement and also increased the length of time fathers were continuously employed, while there were, were no impacts on earnings, but on continuous employment. Um, another example from experimental evaluation, this is from an evaluation of the child support non-custodial parent employment demonstration. Uh, that found that participation in the demonstration did increase non-custodial parent satisfaction with child support services, um, and that's among other positive outcomes, but that one stood out um, just in terms of a, the goal of that demonstration project. So that's a quick summary of some, some takeaways from research and evaluation where we focus on those various aspects of program implementation that Nigel introduced. Well, thanks very much, Mindy. And we'll be hearing again from Mindy in um, a few more minutes. And before um, we bring James up, um, I'd just like to have our second poll question. Can we um, pull that over, Enzo? Enzo is the behind-the-scenes magician who can just make things happen like that. So in terms of these program areas that we've broken it down into, and I know this is not an easy question, but could you just take a um, stab at telling us which of these components you think is most important for the success of responsible fatherhood programs? 
and feel free to check other um, and write anything in that chat box that is not on the screen. Or as we go through the presentation, certainly encourage you to use that chat box. And if you've learned something specific in your work that we haven't addressed or you'd like to highlight, even if we have addressed it, then feel free to tell us that in there. We do collect that um, information and, and review what you put in the chat box. So right now, it looks like we're pretty much across the board here. Outreach and recruitment is um, leading the way. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not reading this right. Staff hiring, training, and support is, is killing this. So you are unanimous almost that staff hiring, training, and support is the most important factor. Without staff, we can't do the work. OK, well, thank you. We will be talking more about that. You were hearing about that from Kenny. but. Now it's my honor to bring up Mr. James Worthy, who is our outreach lead here at the Clearing House. I've known James um, since the early 90s when he was um, working as the director of male involvement at St. Bernardine's uh, Head Start in Baltimore. And they were doing some really innovative things. I, I remember meeting this young chap and um, being quite impressed with him. And he's continued to impress me ever since. He, he went on from that position to work with the Center for Urban Families. And, served an awful lot of fathers in Baltimore and now shares his expertise around the country. So um, we're going to hear from James now. Share your expertise, James. Hey, thank you so much, Nigel. Can you hear me clearly? <laughs> You're coming through right and clear. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm so excited to be here. And I just want to give a, a quick overview of the, the whole outreach portion of fatherhood. And as we look at it, I, I really start this when we saw a major change in the family structure back in the late mid seventies, late seventies, where we started to see fathers removed or leaving the household, and and all of that, you know, if you start to look back from um, the early sixties, there was was a change, and fatherhood immediacy, the, the, the issue of getting the dad, came out of really an attempt to get dads not to abandon children financially. We, we had this whole movement that came out of get the money. Drive, the driving force was to get fathers to support their children, almost in a, a, a mass abandonment movement. And, you know, when you looked at social service roles, they were starting to increase. When, uh, support to women and children was starting to put more uh, tax dollars into households, and it really became a child support issue. Where are the dads? Get them to pay. Get them to pay. Get them to pay. And out of that movement, uh, people like Charles Fowler, who you saw, really started to see there are some things that are, are, are different about what's going on. It wasn't so much abandonment for everyone, it was some absenteeism. There were barriers that were pro, 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 uh, promoting the absence of fathers, whether that be incarceration uh, coming out of Vietnam, uh, whether that be substance abuse, all of those things that really came out of that, that change in our communities, in our country uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And the, the movement of responsible fatherhood started to say, hey, everyone's not uh, uh, abandoning. We need to encourage dads, not so much from a punitive, but encourage and support fathers who have been uh, uh, maybe forced out or have left because of circumstances. And that's where we started to look at assisting and removing barriers with an understanding of what was driving the family structure change. So, so with that being said, you saw all of those programs start to pop up and uh, the, 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 op the option to really try to help dads. And it was at that point, uh, because there was so much um, – so much distrust in our community, we had to start to work on shifting paradigms. We had to move from a punitive to a support 
mechanism. We have to really get to the point that we're not we're not looking for just abandonment, but this absentee. And there was a huge movement that we had to fight against that was called the dead beat dad. And many of us, if we've been around any time, we remember the, the billboards, we remember the, the articles in the newspaper and, and magazines really depicting dads who had left the families as dead beats. And the, the studies, the, the programs that were early in start to say, hey, maybe not dead beat, but dead broke. And there's two sides of the story. And what, what became glaringly obvious is that the, the large majority of fathers absent wasn't because they were dead beat. It was barriers. It was issues. It was things that were driving them away from their families. Uh, and and so, so we had to look at both sides of the story and start to really collect the information to see what it was that was really affecting our families on a, on a national level. Um, and, and we had to get away from just collecting money to, to encouraging that. So these programs, the earlier programs, start to say, hey, let's see if we can help fathers remove some of the barriers, support them in their own development so that they can be there for their children. And some of the early successes, uh, uh, that we learned work was beating dads where they were, and not just um, physically, like location-wise, but mentally and even emotionally. We had to start to deal with the man who we were hoping to be a father, and that's where a lot of the understanding of developing rapport and inviting people, inviting men to participate, that's where that came from, really starting to look at as we, as we go out and we see a dad, we find people who need help, we've got to invite them. And one of the major pieces that just came glaringly out of this work was we had to provide services that basically answered the question, what's in it for me? Because see, here's where we start to see if, if a dad was dealing with incarceration, dealing with unemployment, dealing with uh, uh, substance abuse, dealing with some of the hurdles, some of the barriers of life, then we had to get something to help support that man in getting those barriers removed so that they could be ready to be there for their children. And that meant that the programming, the services, had to be flexible and adaptable. Unlike the rigid, you pay or you go away, we had to really start to look at how do we flexibly support this, this person and also also make sure that the the things that the collections were being done because the children still needed financial support. That never went away. The children still needed the dad to do the work of being a, a, a provider to the child even while they developed the skill to be the nurturer and, and that, that parent unit. So we started to really recruit dads, the early programs, and, and now moving into the programs that are on the ground today, they're recruiting dads with a holistic end in, in mind. So we're recruiting people with retention in mind, meaning as we start to invite you, we're talking about the end result. And with all of that, we found out there is a model, much like any business cycle, there's a model of, of how the recruitment process starts. And this, was, this is huge now today because programs look at it. They understand that they've got to go out and market their program. And that's really getting widespread distribution of information about what's available, uh, about what the uh, intent of it is, to bring awareness to the general population. Because we had to, from the early days, we had to change the general population's perception of what dad was all about. And as we got that audience to start to listen, then we had to reach out, communicate directly with the general public. That's where we were able to define the people who needed and wanted these support services. We start to find out who were the, the people who needed it, who were the people who could support it, and who, what organizations could be a referral source to really drive the outreach process. And when we got those things in place, we understood that now we had to pre present the benefits of participating 
in these services. And that's really where you had to let the potential prospect or, or participant know exactly what areas of support, whether it's employment, whether it's substance abuse recovery, whether it's education, whether it's parenting, what are the things there for that person to develop? And we had to invite and customize that type of uh, uh, programming, which immediately now gave us the ability to enroll the people who needed these services. And on the ground, now you started to see uh, over the last, I'll say 20 years, a number of programs and communities all over the country that are rooted now. They're there. And every single day they're running enrollment uh, programs. They're getting people started in these services. And it's amazing because uh, what, what we're doing based on this lesson, and you see it today on TV, you see it on social media, you see it all this, the marketing material is done with intent. The messaging is done with intent, intent to get dads actively knowing. And it's such, such a major difference today than uh, when I got started in this field better than 25 years ago. Uh, it, it now is it's a movement to get radio, print, TV, mass marketing, using outlets where dads are. You, you hear all the time at barbershops and, and sporting events, and now it's really – attacking uh, the, the mass marketing of a better message for fathers to get the support they need. And with the social media that has come out, you, you, you won't believe if you see right there on the slide, uh, the, the, the National Responsible Father Clearinghouse, really the repository of a lot of the, the information and the how-tos uh, through our, our Responsible Father Toolkit, we've designed a, a actual hotline a national hotline for people to call in, fathers or family members, to get the help that dads need and want. And I tell you, it's amazing because now we've, we've understood that when you get the message, mass media out there, every one of your service agencies or service points have to create a father-friendly environment. We, we just understand now that dads and moms communicate differently. They, they gravitate towards things differently based on intent of them being there. So we're adapting a lot of our traditional services and, and locations to really make sure that dad is included, that literature, semantics, uh, um, um, print is all asking dad to be involved. And then we've got a trained staff. This is, this is where... I love what's happening with the with with a, a national movement with the hotlines for dads with databases of programs for dads. There's a national support system to train and support uh, our staff to really do this work. And that's today. If you really look at the programs that are out there that have kind of put a uh, root in the ground, the average one that's really getting a uh, 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 movement in their communities now have been around anywhere from 10 to 20 years. It really has changed the, the, the thought pattern of what dads are and what dads need to be successful. So, um, and, and I tell you, when, when we talk about it, now that we got these here, now that we're here today, the next step is building the partnerships and and the uh, uh, program stability. And I'm going to step back and turn it over to my partner, uh, Mr. Patrick Patterson, or back to Nigel, to really talk to you about how these programs that are out there have to look for sustainability in the future. So, uh, Nigel, I'll throw it back to you, and I hope I didn't take too long. Hello, Nigel, are you there? Oh, thank you very much, James. I was yammering away on mute. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> I was congratulating you on your presentation. You did well on time. I, I told you you could have an extra minute or two. So um, it's my honor now to introduce my next esteemed colleague, Patrick Patterson. And um, Patrick Patterson is our program manager here at the Clearinghouse. He, he's doing so many things out there in the fatherhood arena, it, it boggles my mind every time he tells me about the next new thing he's doing. And it's a good thing he's still a young man, although it's over 20 years since I met him when he was a really young man. This is back in the late 90s, he was working with dads in South Carolina, and he became yeah. part of our national training team at the um, 
National Partnership for Community Leadership, NPCL. Um, yeah. And he's still one of the finest trainers in this work out there. So, um, Patrick, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me, Nigel? Yeah, you can see. Maybe okay. a little bit later, Patrick. But, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good morning if you're on the West Coast. Just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure uh, being the project manager for the Fatherhood Clearinghouse, but also a chance to just share something I'm really passionate about. Uh, for the next few minutes, I want to talk about two things. One is partnerships, and the second is program sustainability. Um, I'd like to speak in respect to things that we've done in the clearinghouse, and then I'll add some kind of context of things that I've done over the last 20-plus years. Um, on the partnership front, next slide, if you will, um, you'll see that the clearinghouse has partnered with a number of national entities. Uh, the Ag Council is one of our major media partners, but we've also had success with the Chicago Bulls, um, the NFL Players Association, Major League Baseball, NASCAR. Um, you may have seen our ads on TV, but also on billboards across the country, uh, with the Stick With Me Too and then Kung Fu Panda, just to name a few of our partnerships that we've had the last several years. Um, the last two years, we've been host of an amazing opportunity at the Super Bowl where we had a chance to talk with fathers who are professional athletes currently or previous. And the thing that really boggles my mind is that most folks don't see the connection, but if you're on the line and you're doing fatherhood work, you're doing healthy marriage work, you're doing youth work, re-entry work, mentoring work, um, as much as we believe that we need those corporations, those entities, they need us. And I think the thing that we have to figure out in a quick and short order is what's the value that we bring to these organizations. Um, I'm always amazed when I will follow Kenny Braswell or James Worthy or Nigel Vann or Eugene Schneeberg or Joshua Dubois, and I'll see them connecting with larger entities that seem not connected to the fatherhood or marriage or reentry work, but they are because they are also trying to improve our community. So next slide. I want to just kind of talk about some of the key elements um, of partnerships. Um, and as a backdrop, um, for some of you guys, if you're paying attention to um, federal websites or grants.gov, you probably saw yesterday that the federal fatherhood, healthy marriage, and now youth-focused grants were forecasted. There was an announcement yesterday made. It's not the actual RFP but you'll see the language that speaks to what these proposals, these RPs may include when they're released. There's estimated timeline, there's an estimated budget. If you don't have that information, you can follow back up with us after the webinar. But one of the things I want to bring attention to is in each of those um, documents, it speaks to partners. There was a day in time where an organization used to fund singularly, Avi Mulhern, and they would just give money to Eric Baseri, and they would say, Go do great work, and we'll look forward to seeing the outcomes when you finish. Today, most funders have limited dollars with increased need. And so what they ask for is that people who are applying for grants or funding, that they form partnerships. And so here are some of the key ingredients that we believe are core to working strong partnerships. I'm going to start left to right, and I'm going to start with trust and mutual respect. There has to be a mutual respect for what I bring and what you bring to the partnership. Um, I have seen several formations of partnerships, and one, the ones that work best is when there's a mutual appreciation for the value of a partner. Now, you may be only a referral partner. You may just be providing food. You may be providing jobs. You may be providing training. But there has to be a value add with your partners. The second one, if you're going uh, left to right, is shared vision for how to deliver quality product, service or product. Um, it is so important, I won't have time today to talk about it, but that you have a plan, a logic model, that showcase how you both plan to get to the end zone. I'm a sports guy. What is our play? What, are we, what play are we running to get us into the end zone or to score a basket? We each need to have a role in making that, but there has to be a shared vision with respect to what we're trying to do. We're trying to get more kids out of poverty. We're trying to get more fathers employed. We're trying to get more co-parents to visit um, shared parenting time. We have to have a shared vision um, around quality service or product. The third one is a jointly defined win-win for you and your partners. What's in it for you and what's in it for me? 
Um, this also includes a conversation around budget. I know in this space, because there's a lot of heavy, bleeding heart folks who love to do the work, and it's just purely passion-driven, but there has to be a conversation with respect to budget and finances, and there has to be a win-win. If I am delivering groups for your program or you're doing transportation, there should be some financial benefit to my organization that benefits us. Beyond the finances, there also should be something that advances both of our causes. And so there has to be clear win-win uh, when you think about the formation of strong partnerships. The fourth, this is critical, guys, open and regular communication. Um, a long time ago, a long time ago, when I was a Fed, one of my favorite mentors would say to me, in the absence of communication, people generally assume nothing is happening. They don't assume that if I haven't heard from you, oh, wow, he or she is out recruiting the earth. They assume he or she is doing nothing. And so one of the things that we do here at the Clearing House, very powerful about this, is we try to ensure that there's open and regular communication. Sometimes it's weekly. Um, sometimes it's on the phone. Sometimes it's in a report. Sometimes it's using technology. Sometimes it's using systems that provide communication. But there has to be open and regular communication. I have seen too many groups form with huge momentum, and then when one thing goes not according to the plan, they disband communication. And then there's a breakdown in the relationship. You have to communicate. You have, in all relationships, but particularly in the formation of partnerships, you have to communicate. It's very, very, very important. And then fifth um, but not last, is define roles and performance expectations in writing. Um, as a trained social worker, a long time ago I learned if it's not written down, it never happens. And so when you think about partnerships, MOUs, um, memorandums of understanding, um, team and agreements, those things should be developed up front. I'm a big fan of documenting things at the very start of the conversation versus in a re reparation where you're trying to fix something mode. Uh, all of these agreements can be expanded and edited, but in the beginning, it's really important to say, hey, partner, um, I'm excited about this relationship we have, but I'd like to at least get some things on paper. Let's use your template or my template, or let's share a template that we both do use and try to find out what do we both need in an agreement that speaks to what you'll do, what we'll do, how long we'll do it, what are the, te what are the terms? You know, I know folks who have these indefinite agreements. There needs to be some kind of closure where you review and assess the effectiveness of the partnership. Um, it is nothing worse than being in a relationship that is not going well, but you just have to stay in it because you never did say when there's an end date. In these partnerships, you have to have defined roles and performance expectations. You should not agree to partner with someone who's going to do recruitment for you, and there not be a number, 100 fathers, 100 parents. There has to be some measurable outcome that you use to determine whether this is going well or whether it needs to be enhanced in some way, form, or fashion. So there's more there, but one of the things that I put at the center of this is just clarity, um, focus, outcomes. Um, I believe that if you focus on your outcomes, the income will come. The outcomes drive everything. So this is really important for partnerships. I'm going to switch quickly to my last slide, which is really a topic that I'm really, really, really passionate about, is program sustainability. Um, over the course of my career, I've had a chance to write and win more than $50 million in grants in all sorts of fashions. Um, it is one of the things I know people struggle with. And so over the years, we found that um, giving people the tools is really what helps folks build confidence. But in, where I grew up in South Carolina, they would say it takes money to buy land. And for you guys, if you're doing this good work, as big as your heart is, it takes resources to do the work. And so here are some lessons that we've learned that are really, really, really important. Not on the slide, but I would just give you guys as a backdrop. Most funders, most funders, when they think about applications, there's one large question, and it's phrased differently, but I'm just going to translate right to the meat of the matter. Here's the question that most funders want to know when you send up an application or request for funding or request for support, is what you're doing nice to do or necessary. There's a difference there. Nice to do is an ice cream truck that rides through a neighborhood. That's, that's really nice. Necessary is a physical facility that is a safe haven for kids to save them from maybe gun violence, could be after school activities, it could be 
um, academic enrichment, nice to do or necessary. If your proposal has flowery bed of ease and really gives people a sense that, oh, this is really cute, it won't get considered as strongly. So you want to look at what makes your program necessary. What's the need that you are trying to meet that gives the funder the, the, the urgency to fund you so that you can serve more people? It's, it's really important that as you're thinking about this next round of grants, this next round of funding that you may pursue, whether it be federal, whether it be foundation or corporate, that you look at answering that question, is what we're offering really something that's nice or is it, ne is it necessary? Is it saving lives? Is it saving time? Is it saving resources? Very important. Here are four lessons. Before you apply, you have to research the funders prior to contact. And there's several ways to you. There was a day and time you had to drive to D.C. or drive to Philadelphia, drive to Florida to meet a funder. Today, all time of night, you can go on the World Wide Web and find out what their priorities are. In a lot of cases, I worked for a foundation some years ago, one of the things that never happens that foundations always ask is that you call. Research them. Make a phone call. I, my name is Patrick Patterson. I am in Tallahassee. I'm definitely interested in applying for your grants, but I'd love to just hear more about what you guys have as priorities. I've been on your website. I see these are your three things, but can I get more? Can you share more? Open the conversation up so that you build that relationship. You see the big word relationship there. The second one, uh, lesson is you have to have a target. There has to be a target that drives your fundraising and there has to be a subsequent plan to get you there. There's nothing worse than having this enormous target with no plan to get there. Um, it's really important that you spend time with somebody who can help you think about your fundraising target and your plan to get you there. And most folks target only federal grants, but I'm here to tell you there are billions, that's what the B, of dollars that are out there for organizations like yours that are corporate, that are community-based, that are university-led, that would fund and partner with you. So you want to think about your fundraising target and your plan. Third is fundraising sustainability is not a job for one person. Um, I do a lot of conversation with folks who we hire a grant writer, and they think the grant writer has this magic pen and it can do it by themselves. It has to be part of a system in the agency. So if you have hired a grant writer for this next season of grants, please surround them with the support, whether it be an intern, a budget person, an accountant, making sure they have what they need to write a strong application. But this is not a job for one person. So if you are making that a one-person job, please consider adding supports around them. And here's the last thing I'll share. Um, one of my favorite rules is the 50% versus zero rule. And there are mathematicians I know who are on this webinar. One of the questions that I would ask you is, if you apply for a grant, what are your odds? 50-50. Most of us understand the why as to why we're doing the work, the why factor. I'm driven by a why. I want to see fathers connected to their children and families. So when I write grants, I think about these guys are counting on me. These kids are counting on me. Um, so I have to apply. You guys have to apply. Your odds are 50-50. Here's the second question. If you don't apply for the grant, what are your odds? That's the zero rule. So in these cases where most folks, and here's a, a simple fact, most folks don't apply because they're afraid of not getting funded. But your mind, your mind gets you to your funding more so than anything you write. When I write, I think about the picture with the big check and Wells Fargo. When I write, I think about seeing a busload of fathers going to an event with their children. I don't think, what if we don't get funded? I think, what if we do get funded? And so you have to think and have a team of folks around you that believe that what you're writing is going to help sustain your organization. I am so excited about the folks who are on the line and also what's to come next. And just want to close out by saying everything that you do is connected to funding. So you can't have this beautiful home and nothing on the inside. You have to think about what are the resources that support the organization. With that, I'll turn the go to Nigel. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. And so um, for the next word, we, we get to hear from our fifth leader, um, 
Kenneth Braswell, he's our project director. He's got 30 years experience managing and leading fatherhood and community programs. Besides leading the clearinghouse, he's also the CEO of Fathers Incorporated, and he previously led the New York State Fatherhood Initiative. Like Patrick, he's involved in many, many aspects of fatherhood work, and he also makes me feel tired thinking about everything he does. But it's uh, been a true pleasure to be working under his leadership for these last nine years. So um, please, can you share some wisdom with the group? <laughs> thank you so much, Nigel, um, and thank you to um, everyone who's on the line who has taken out time today to spend with the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse and hear um, some of you know what we've learned. I heard Nigel say at the beginning of this um, that there was over 100 years of experience. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about that. And so, but if it is as a contributor to the work, I'll take my little small percentage of that 100. I'm not trying to claim that total 100, but it just kind of sends shock waves through my body when I heard that number. Um, the other thing, and uh, listening to Patrick um, in his presentation, I don't, I don't often disagree with Patrick, but there is one thing he said that I disagree with, and he used the analogy of the ice cream truck being um, necessary, and I would say that in Atlanta, when you have 78 straight days of 90 degree weather, an ice cream truck is necessary. And so, um, depending on where you are in the country, you might want to put that in your grant, and it, it, it might attract fathers to your program to have an ice cream truck. And so, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of the fatherhood field from my own lens and how I've seen this over the past 15 years of specifically doing responsible fatherhood work. But more generally, um, in the 30 years of doing um, community service work at a time that I didn't necessarily call the work that I did, um, fatherhood work, but spent a lot of that of those 15 years also working with dads and working with family. And I described the field um, a couple of days ago to Nigel as a quilt, and I said that over the last 30 years or so of the responsible fatherhood work, that it has grown and diversified. And I remember when I came into this work um, back in the early 2000s, tail end of 1990s, I'm somewhat, you know, cutting my teeth, so to say, with some of the giants of the responsible fatherhood field, um, Dr. Ron Mincy and Jeff Johnson and Jerry Taho and Robert Johnson and Joe Jones and others and Charles Ballard um, within the national um, leadership group. And really doing that work and being able to sit back and, like, hear the wisdom that they brought to the table at that point. And becoming their colleagues, like I never thought back then that I would actually be their colleagues. I thought that I would always be um, trailing them in the greatness that they are. And then taking on the work in the state of New York and overseeing the national responsible fatherhood work that we were doing in the state of New York for those five years where I got a chance to work very closely with both Dr. Ron Mincy and Elaine Sorrison of the Urban Institute at the time, and got to always um, be able to lean on their wisdom, their expertise, their experience, um, and their advice with respect to how I should, as someone who wanted to engage in this work, oversee this work and to be able to put the right lens and perspective on the work that we were doing. And so as the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse, when we took this work over 10 years ago, I have always seen this body of work as the thread of that quilt. And how we function each and every day is to ensure that all threads connect all the blotches of the quilt that are necessary to do the work. And we've been able to touch many of those blocks in this quilt and be able to remain connected to them. And the quilt continues to get even bigger. And so I'm excited by, you know, all of the folks on the line. I'm particularly interested in the ones that are on the webinar that was here more than 30 years and those 20-year veterans that have been around and laboring in this work for so long and have so much expertise with respect to this work. 
And so um, we're going to go to the next slide. So program leadership has always been important to me with respect to understanding uh, where we were, um, where we are, and where we want to go. And one of the things that I've seen throughout my career in this space and also overseeing both Fathers Incorporated and the Clearinghouse is that leadership has become extremely important. And so when it comes to staff members, key staff members, um, the passion through which they embody this work and how they champion this work moving forward. I think that um, my previous colleagues, James, um, Mindy, Nigel, and Patrick, did a great job in kind of laying out the processes and the policies and some of the hard-level things that we must know in doing this work. But then there's this other element, right? There's this other element of the passion that we bring to the work and the desire that we bring to the work and the need to um, have great outcomes and to do great work and to improve the, the well-being of lives in our community. And all of those things that we bring to this work as a passion, those things are important. But the other piece that's important to know about that is that in this space of program leadership, or program leadership, right, that we've got to be mindful that that passion permeates through the entire organization and through the entire body of work. Because unfortunately, what I've seen in my space, including my New York work, and that is when the champions leave the space, so too does the work. And that was very disheartening to me to see what happened to that body of work solely because the individuals that was driving the work left the work. And I'm talking about Robert Doerr, who took a chance with me in bringing me into the state of New York to do this work. David Hansel, who came in after him and really kind of helped me really understand this work from a governmental perspective. Um, point of view, and then myself, who then went on to do other things, and then to see what happened. If you remember back in the early days of the fatherhood space, there were several statewide networks and organizations moving responsible fatherhood field, and all of those efforts were led by champions who then left to do something different, to do something more progressive, to change jobs, or whatever the case may be. But when those individuals moved on, the work left as a result. And for program leadership, we should be thinking about not only the development of the programs to which we're trying to serve dads and their families, but also the infrastructure that holds that in place as well. Next slide. And so there's a key element to kind of understand um, where we are in this space, and it's something that I've been really talking about, and I want to just kind of lay this out in a couple of minutes so you really understand where you are in this space. And so there is a distinct difference between fatherhood organizations and fatherhood programs that then attaches itself back to what I just previously talked about about. When you look across the spectrum of social work and you look across the spectrum of work that's done in this country in the fatherhood space, there are very few fatherhood organizations. What do I mean by fatherhood organizations? I mean organizations that are legally structured, that are primarily led through their mission, that are funded to do the very specific work of responsible fatherhood, right? And then there are fatherhood programs. There are programs that are within larger organizations that may not necessarily have fatherhood as a primary function of the agency that tend to come and go as it relates to the level of funding within that particular agency, which is why we've seen so much of the turnover over the last 20 years of responsible fatherhood work. And part of what we have to begin to do is to begin to successfully integrate the responsible fatherhood work into the normalcy of the larger spectrum of social work. 
And if we don't begin to start thinking about what that looks like, talking to college and academia about creating curriculums and, 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 and pieces of work that are within schools of social work that are beginning to train our social workers how to work specifically with dads and talking to teaching institutions and talking to them about cultivating their students to want to go into the field of social work as males and those kinds of things. And so if we don't begin to distinguish those two things, the fatherhood organizations and the fatherhood programs, we could very quickly not have any more fatherhood organizations and still haven't built the necessary infrastructure within the social work and the fatherhood space and other disciplines of fatherhood programs to sustain a body of work that so many of us have put our efforts, our passion, and our work into for the last 30 years to sustain itself. And that could be a whole um, a webinar in and of itself. Take me to the next screen, guys. And so, again, as we come back and we begin to talk about this program leadership, um, it is extremely important to go back to what I was talking about before. As you build either your fatherhood organizations or your fatherhood programs, to really understand that one-on-one -on -one interaction and that case management piece. And what I like to call it is the relational piece, right? How do you relate to the client? How do you relate to the dad? Does your atmosphere relate to the dad? Does your staff relate to the dad? Does your process relate to the dad? Does the space that or does the work that you're trying to accomplish relate to the dad? I think it's the biggest issue with respect to retention of fathers in our space, getting them to come into your space and staying into our space, because oftentimes they walk into those places and they do not find a relationship with either the organization, the staff that are running it, the vision of the organization, and they come and go. I think one of the more important things I saw on the chat that people are talking about, recruitment and retention. I think one of the areas to which we fail our fathers in this space that I've seen over the last 15 years of my work is this word consistency, right? Uh, we have not been consistent with our dads. We have not been consistent with the work. We have not been consistent with the messages. And so it's very difficult um, for guys to want to walk into your space if they don't know whether or not you're going to be there next week. They don't know whether or not the program is going to exist in a year. They don't know whether or not the outcomes are actually going to serve them in the areas of their need. And so there's this area of consistency that we really have to kind of work on, particularly within the facilitation of our workshop and the providing of our services. Last screen. And so staff training and support becomes extremely critical um, in this space. Um, our staff, they have to be trained and consistently trained. These webinars are important. I implore you, every time the Clearinghouse does a webinar or anybody else for that matter that does a webinar around responsible fatherhood work, glean from that expertise. Um, reading. If you're not reading what you love, you're not advancing in the area that you want to excel. And so reading, writing, creating your own content, creating what you'll, you've learned, everything that we read doesn't have to be evidence-based as long as it's evidence-informed. If you can show that you're doing great work, if you can prove that you're doing great, great work, then share that with others, understanding that everything doesn't work for everybody, right? And so that there is a need for the diversity of the work that we do around the country because our dads is as diverse as the need. And so when you're looking at dads in rural areas, urban areas, uh, mountain areas, uh, northern areas, southern areas, western areas, cultural areas, all of those individuals need something that is designed and coupled for them to be able to receive their own understanding of this notion of responsible fatherhood. And so I think I am at my time now, absolutely. Um, I could have gone on in several other different spaces, but I think I'm going to leave it there and turn it back over to you, Nigel.
Thank you very much, Kenny. Yeah, and we'll, we'll give you a few more minutes here in, in a minute. Um, we've got a few questions in. I, I'm just going to ask um, Mindy to respond to one of them, and then I think I'm going to come back to the team to give their thoughts on the road ahead, and then we'll answer as many more questions as we can before we get done. So please do keep um, sending your questions in. So, Mindy, the, the first question that came in after your presentation was asking um, if you could talk a little bit about best practices for engaging staff from other organizations to work with fathers in your own program. But not your program, personally, of course. But. Sure, yeah. Um, and there's a couple of things that come to mind most immediately. Um, I think, importantly, thinking about um, identifying some shared goals um, across organizations for fathers. Um, and so your program may be doing some some set of services, another program might be doing other services, but you know, kind of having con conversations and coming to an understanding of the shared commitment to fathers and families and shared goals to I think can really help set the stage for collaboration and, and get staff from other organizations to feel sort of um, buy-in and, and committed to, to supporting the, the fathers in, in your programs. Um, other strategies that uh, have been discussed in some of the studies that we talked about um, are finding ways to sort of bring those staff to your organization, so whether it's shared space um, for your program and then other services for fathers, or even just some kind of um, temporary visits that the staff can do to come to your site. And again, that I think helps with a shared understanding and, and really seeing the vision um, that the, your program has um, for working with fathers. Um, Cross-training is, is something else that's important, so thinking about not, not just um, what that pro other program can do for you and your fathers, but what can you do for that program too, so what maybe going in and training their staff on something that's sort of unique to what you bring to your program and to fathers, and then also having staff come in from that partner organization um, to train your staff. Um, so I think those, those are some initial thoughts, and, and they all, to me, point to sort of that meaningful collaboration and, and providing opportunities to really work together in a meaningful way. Um, you know, it's not some logistical thing, just kind of regular check-in, so not just sort of a one-time training, but regular check-ins with teams, I think really helps to facilitate collaboration and sort of growing together. Okay, well, thanks, Minnie. So well, I'm going to flip this back to... Um, you, Kenny, if I can, um, and we, we, you know, we've got this cute picture of the road ahead here. So we, we did talk about this webinar as understanding the past to improve the future. So we just want to take a little bit of a peek into what we think may lay ahead, and then we'll come back and answer a few more questions. So, um, Kenny, if you'd like to go over what you've got on this slide. Absolutely. I won't go through all of them. I mean, um, there's a couple of them that I do want to highlight, and I actually have two that I want to drop in here that's not on the slide that I thought about this morning. Um, that first one, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, much of what we're doing out here, someone else has done. That's why the network is so important. That's why we have to remain in the space together so that we can learn from each other, so that we can share our successes for each other and our lessons learned to each other. Um, the wheel would the will will eventually evolve on its own as it has over the last 30 to 40 years, um, but we definitely don't need to create um, a sameness of the things that we are already doing. The second thing is this whole notion of new blood in the fatherhood field. I think that, um, and we even, I've heard several people talk about this over the course of my career, um, the jewels and the treasure are within, are within our own spaces. And so we're working with dads and we're looking for individuals to kind of pick up this work. Um, we have to begin to start thinking about this notion of peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer teaching and peer-to-peer -peer volunteering and bringing some of those dads who show aptitude and a passion for this work to be able to bring them back into your organizations and cultivate them to be um, leaders and facilitators and, and thought leaders in the space of work that we're trying to accomplish. 
and funding is always an issue. Um, funding and consistent funding, I think that we, Patrick, laid that out very well and being consistent and going after funds that don't necessarily have the word fatherhood in it, um, going after funds that are speaking about family, that are speaking about parenting, that are speaking about education, housing, substance abuse, um, domestic violence, whatever the subject matters are, um, you have the ability to apply for those grants. The cohort that you're working with just happens to be fathers, but just because fatherhood is not in the title of the grant doesn't mean that the grant is not for you. And then the two things that I want to drop in um, that I didn't think about before, and one connects back to my early start in this career, and one kind of connects with where I am now, and that is a revisiting and looking at earned income tax credits for low-income dads. That was something that we did in New York. I believe the uh, Washington, D.C. tried to do it on a smaller scale. The city of New York tried to do it, and we really got to start thinking about um, how do we give our low-income dads income incentives and with respect to child support and with respect to being able to compensate for those monies that other people are allowed to be able to hear or assume, consume tax credits for. And so I think that that needs to be lifted again. That conversation needs to be risen again so that we can kind of talk about the importance of something that worked very well in the past and kind of died on the vine, and we need to kind of relift that conversation. And then the last thing is this notion of generational concepts, right, that relates then to technology. And so if you are a program that are working with families, particularly young families, fathers, 16 to 24 years old, and you're still using the term millennial, you are wrong. That age group are no longer millennials. They are what they are called generation Zers. They are very different from millennials, and they are different in this primary way. Millennials use technology as a tool. Generation Gers are actually integrated into a technology frame of thought, which means that everything that they do is through technology. And so while posters, while flyers on the tree may have worked back in the early 2000s, um, where letters and those kinds of things may have gotten you some space with respect to recruitment, if you're not integrating technology into not only the way that you're speaking to this cohort of dads, but also how you're integrating with this cohort of dads, you're going to lose your ability to be able to recruit young fathers into your program. They speak, they understand, and they show up in the space of technology. And so the field itself, as we move forward, has to begin to think about how we're going to expand our ability to be able to incorporate technology in the way that we're able to speak to this younger cohort of dads in the same effective way that we've been able to speak to the older generation. And we are happy to say as the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse that we are going to be engaging in something that begins to move us in that space with our virtual collaborative community that will be launched in June. So I'll leave it there. I won't tell you more than that, and I'll turn it back over to Mike. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah. So um, now I'm going to just move this to Mindy's slot. So if you can just take a minute or two and highlight a few of these things here, Mindy. Sure, yeah, and I can I can be brief here. I think the conversation today has kind of pointed to um, where there's opportunities for continued research and evaluation on many of the implementation strategies that we're talking about today. Um, something that's not on the slide that I just thought about, though, is sort of thinking very thoughtfully about what capacity your organization has for for research and evaluation. And so not sort of jumping to a, a big RCT if, if there's sort of not the infrastructure and readiness for that. And there's a lot of steps um, before, before that large-scale rigorous evaluation to take to, to really think about improving your program through research and evaluation. So um, there's a lot of different options for the types of evaluation design 
um, that's kind of best for for each you know for each um, situation. Um, and then just a couple other points from here in terms of thinking ahead. In addition to that, sort of focus on rigorous research and evaluation on program implementation. Uh, I think continuing to focus on really understanding the strengths and also challenges that fathers and families face and kind of drawing on that and more um, identifying and developing services. And so really understanding the factors that contribute to, to fathers' experiences, um, thinking about different types of fathers. You know, some fathers live with their children, some don't. Some fathers are married, some are not. There are young fathers. Um, just a range of experiences that shape fathers and fatherhood. And, and you know, different fathers bring different strengths as well to, to, their, pro, to their families and programs. So really leveraging and building on those strengths as well. Um, and then just one final point is, is really thinking about how to build the capacity of our programs to conduct research and use data for program improvement purposes and really kind of monitoring program activities and informing program improvement on sort of a continuous basis, which I, I know came up in some of the, the chat. So very important to, to build the capacity of programs um, to participate in research and use data for, for program improvement purposes. Important point, Mindy, that we have to sort of, you know, as, from the program level, you have to look at what your capacity is to do in kind of thorough research and programs by and large need help to do that beyond just getting the information that can help the program. So in terms of moving the field ahead, it's more a place for the research community in many ways. So James, just a few thoughts um, quickly on um, the road ahead in terms of technology. Can you sort of frame that very well? I thought, yeah. Absolutely, and and uh, Kenny hit it right on the head. Um, as as we move into uh, the road ahead, the the reach of technology, the use of technology, is going to have to to be integrated in everything we do, whether it be social media, whether it be uh, mobile apps, all of those things, because the, that movement is already being seen. When you when you're able to go and see that. Facebook pages are, you know, now 200, 300,000 fathers following them. Uh, you look at uh, educational programs for dads being email and mobile apps delivered. It is a huge change in in how communication, how things work. So this this movement is going to continue to grow. Uh, it's going to be an international movement, and the use of technology and the ability for us as practitioners and people doing this work to be able to use the strategies that have been proven, but to take those strategies into use with technology is where we'll be moving. So with that being said, I'll, I'll leave it there and just uh, share with people to visit some of the pages out there like Fatherhood Gov on Facebook or our Fatherhood Gov page on uh, uh, on Twitter and and uh, all of those areas because that's where the most the movement is going in recruiting and talking with and, and serving that okay thank you very much James so um, Patrick I just give you a minute or two to reflect on um, the future in terms of the funding side yeah I, I said a lot of it earlier um, but two things I would say, um, just really think beyond your normal avenues for funding. Um, I speak about corporate funding because I've experienced it, but also know that in every community there are agencies that want to fund the work that you guys are doing. Beyond cash, I would also encourage folks to think about in-kind. I've seen people say cash or in-kind. I like to think cash and in-kind. Uh, last year we did a huge event. In South Carolina, we had a, a, a restaurant donate $10,000 worth of food, hot food, for our fathers and men that were there. Um, that could have been cash out of my pocket, but that was an in-kind donation. So I just ask that people think beyond cash. The last thing is use technology. Uh, there are so many ways. You see funders, individual donors, and your fundraiser. There's so many other ways that you can leverage what you're doing by using technology. And so I'll close with that just saying, Go get it, man. Go get it. You have to apply. Go get it. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, but you, you got to have a nice screenshot there, right? Yeah.
Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I'm skipping over the other side of mine. I'll, I'll bring it back up in a minute. I, I don't want to take too much time here because I do want to go to Q and A. I did just want to put this slide up for a minute. Um, quick note on what works for effective group facilitation, and, and take the opportunity to encourage you to download, if you haven't already, the tip card on facilitation. We have two tip cards in the downloadable resources. One is tips for practitioners on facilitation, and one is um, tips for practitioners on recruitment. So this slide here is just a few closing thoughts from me in terms of the overall presentation. I'm not going to talk about it. I'll leave this on the screen for a minute. And now I'm just going to move into our Q&A and ask a few questions of um, some of our, our presenters here. So um, Patrick, if I can come back to you for the first one. And sure. this is a question about ways to partner with local battered women's shelters as well as other mm -hmm. programs involved in prevention work and recovery therapy. Any thoughts on that, Torres? Absolutely. Just really quickly. Um, those are extremely important partners. Uh, I believe 20 years ago, my first inter, um, presentation with the Domestic Violence Group in Pennsylvania, um, I think I lost a leg. I mean, they chewed me to pieces because I wasn't sure about the connection between what they wanted versus what I wanted. Often we see them separating families. The truth of the matter is they want the same thing we want, which is safety and family permanency for our families. And so I always encourage folks, before you go public, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them to kind of establish what's the common ground between you and a DV or women's shelter. I believe in my heart, and I've experienced it, they want the same thing that you want in your fatherhood or marriage program. But start that, the last thing I'll say is have a DV protocol that advises your staff that also includes that local resource to your program. I'll stop there, Nigel. Okay, thanks, Patrick. So, um, Kenny, uh, a couple of questions for you. Um, somebody asked, uh, how can a program expect to progress if they can't keep a designated establishment? And another question to follow up on that, how do we stay consistent with our staff training? How do I stay what with our staff training? Yes. Um, well, I, I answer the first question first in terms of, how can the program progress if they can't keep a designated place, a designated establishment? Um, partnership. Um, we talked a lot in the beginning about partnership. Um, and partnership is designed to compensate for the things that you either do not have the ability to obtain yourself or you have weaknesses in. And so, um, I know that we're in this space sometimes where we want to do it all on our own and we don't want to share the headline with anybody else or tagline with anybody else. But sometimes partnerships can be great, you know, in terms of just evolution and growth, and right? And so just because you partner with something or something or someone in the beginning doesn't mean that you have to permanently be attached to them. And so look for, you know, for instance, what we've done here in Atlanta um, in our direct services is we've partnered with the YMCA here in Atlanta, and we use their facilities. And because we bring a service into the facilities, I don't have to worry about facilities. Uh, we partner with another organization called the University for Parents that provide curriculum for low-income families in Atlanta. Two things I don't have to worry about. I don't have to worry about location because the location is already set, and I don't have to worry about recruitment because they do their own recruitment. And so I think that one of the best ways to um, maintain that establishment is to begin to look for partners that can compensate for the things that you're going to need for your own long-term sustainability. And actually, I'm going to skip the second question I started asking you, Kenny, because I, I realized that it actually sort of blends into a series of questions that we've had in terms of work in rural areas where it's, it's more difficult to educate fathers and communities, one person pointed out. And so the question, there's a number of questions really, but if, um, let me see here. What are some keys to help motivate nonprofits in the, in the communities to help fathers and also some ways to connect with fathers themselves 
So if I could just ask one or two of you just to maybe reflect a little bit on how we do this work in rural communities in a general sense. We'll ask James to answer first if, he, if he's still on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll address, can you hear me clearly? Yep. I'm going to do clearly. Yep. Work. Great, great, great. One of the things that, that we do, and, and I'll talk uh, rural Oklahoma, um, there is a, a, very, a very distinct message and way to work in, your, in rural population. Because the, the area is spread out, it does not mean there's not a sense of community. It may not be easy to pull together. So one of the things that we've seen in some of the rural populations is to actually be able to work uh, in a home visit model almost, working with dads in, in the area that they are. And that then brings up a whole different level. I know I've worked out in, um, in Montana where working with the Head Starts, where they would do their home visits, and they may only get one or two home visits in a day because of the vast amount of uh, uh, real estate they had to travel, but it, they were also intentionally on each one of those looking to bring dads, get dads involved in the process. And one of the things that, and Patrick speaks to this all the time when he's training, is you have to involve a father by allowing that father to be uh, an educator of, of you and their child. And what do I mean by that? You can't always tell a, a dad or tell someone what they need to do, this is how it should be, this is. You have to ask their buy-in. You have to ask them to be a part of it. So in a, in a national or, or in a, a rural area, you may not touch as many people in one sitting, but you do have to go to the people in those areas, and and I'll, I'll throw it to someone else if they have anything else they'd like to share. You want to add anything, Patrick? No, I think he captured it. I think in the rural spaces, you got to use what you understand locally. Um, I have one phrase that drives all of my work in foster, and it's literally those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. And so any program that's trying to work with families that hasn't spoken to the families, you're missing it. And so I've always learned to engage them routinely, repeatedly, finding out where they like to have service, what days, what times. Once you get those answers, that drives and gives you a blueprint for what works best versus the kind of white horse, white power mentality where you come in and you're projecting what you think works. Okay. And I see that Kenny's just posted something in the chat box there. Um, you know, there was a question about the grant opportunities that Patrick had mentioned. So I, I think that's what that is, Kenny, right? That's the um, that's the, the recent announcement. So you can yeah. see more about that. And um, Kenny's actually having some grants cut outside his place at the moment, so I'm not going to go to him immediately to talk. But um, I would tell you people to go to grants.gov and type in fatherhood or marriage or youth. It's not the RFP. It's not the actual RFP, but there is like a preview of those, they should still be up. If it's not, it's, it's, we have copies, but it's a forecast. But grant.gov in the search box, type in those search words and you'll find some previews. Kenny's just sorry, in the chat box as well. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Patrick. I was just saying, um, Kenny should put that in the chat box as well so everybody can see it there. Uh, there's a question about if we're going to have another fan in the fire summit. Does anyone know that? I don't think there's any immediate plans, right? Not right now. No. And then there's a question about um, someone would love to see a pool of fatherhood consultants and trainers that they could access to ensure they're on track. Uh, you can certainly email the father clearinghouse or call the 877-4-411 number. They can refer you to people in your communities. So, But there's not that one pool there yet. And that's one of the things Kenny was talking about with the idea of actually resurrecting the National Practitioners Network for Fathers and Families. One more quick question, um, and I, there's not time for everybody to respond to this, but if um, someone would like to answer this, it's um, a question from a Head Start program where there's a lot of women staff. You know, this comes up a lot. Do you think that having only women staff can be a barrier in reaching fathers or a lot of women staff? This person says, I don't think men would want to hear from a woman. 
a male perspective is needed. You want to feel that, James? I will definitely feel that. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, being, being though I started my entire career in a Head Start center, and I'll be very honest, my center had uh, three men that worked there, myself, the custodian, and one gentleman in the kitchen. And the leader of our male involvement uh, movement at that place who hired me was actually a female. Uh, she was the director. Um, so there's a couple things to that. Um, I do believe if properly trained, the ability to reach out, outreach, and recruit men can come from either men or women. And it does make a, a difference to have uh, co-facilitators or male facilitators so that you can give men a space of comfort. But there are always going to be times where men will reveal something to a, 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 a woman in, in, in a situation before they'll reveal it to a man. So I don't think it, it hinders. It, however, it is it does require training, and it does require the, the evaluation of people's implicit bias towards other gender. But I don't think it stops you from doing the work. And then it encourages you to look at your staff and make sure that you're, you're bringing staff in, uh, male staff, that is capable of doing the work. But, again, it does not stop you from doing the work. For that, James, you know, I mean, it's, just being a man does not qualify you to do this work, you know. Just, um, Absolutely just not. Being a man have the same age or the same background as the guys you're working with doesn't qualify you. You know, I've seen I've seen some terrible group facilitation, for instance, um, but I've seen some wonderful stuff by women, particularly I, there's one lady who always comes to my mind. She had these guys captivated in prison, and they they hate on the pot of every word. You know, I, I went in there, and it's all these big guys and this little gal, and boy, she, she had them right there. So... Yep. We, I appreciate everybody staying with us here. I think we got the most of your questions, but if any came in that, that we didn't, we will um, post a written response to those. I want to give each of my colleagues a chance for a quick final thought, and then we will let you all go. Um, so, James, you, you were on the line, so just very quickly, one or two sentences with a, a final thought for the group here. And my last sentence is thank you. Use this, use the fatherhood, uh, responsible fatherhood toolkit to support you in growing your, your work. Thank you. Mindy? Yeah, just um, really excited about all the different strategies discussed today and the research and evaluation that's happening. Focus on those topics and excited to see what comes from all of this good work. Hey, Patrick? Uh, just thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for a great job facilitating. Thank you for all that you stayed with us throughout the entire webinar and make it happen. You have to apply. And I'll, I'll just say again, you know, what a pleasure it is to have been able to share the time here as a group. You know, I've um, I've been involved in this longer than anybody else um, on the team here, but only only barely. And you know, some days I get frustrated because I think we're still faced with a lot of the same problems we were back then. Kenny mentioned the earned income, earned income tax credit. I remember Ron Mincy talking about that back in, or oh, the first time I met him, which was a, I was facilitating a group discussion, and that must have been 92 maybe. And so there's things like that that we haven't progressed on, but we've progressed on a lot of other things, and um, I do see a lot of positives moving ahead. So I'm going to give Kenny the last word, and then we will wrap this up, and you'll get an evaluation form pop up to tell us what you think about today and any other information you want to give us. Kenny? Have you finished cutting your grass, Kenny? Are they have? Are you? Oh, yeah, I'm here. No. So I just want to take that. It, this is Atlanta. It's, it's February, and they're literally outside cutting grass right now. And so... So I want to I want to thank everyone for um, coming out today and supporting us. Uh, 
um, through this webinar and make sure that you continue to stay connected to the National Response to Father of the Clearing House. I still get up each and every morning as excited about this work. Um, obviously, there are things that can frustrate you and things that could serve as barriers, but they're all turned into challenges for me um, that I gladly step into each and every day trying to find a solution for. And so my lasting word is continue to let the passion drive you, and let's learn together. Okay. Well, thank you, Kenny. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank those of you who stayed on the line. It looks like most people did. So um, I wish you a good day and hope to see you through, through our Twitter chat next Tuesday and our next webinar, April 22nd. And um, please respond to the survey and let us know what you think. Good afternoon, everybody. And for some, you should stay on the line if you want to.